In the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I do with profound reverence. I ask for the pardon of my sins and the grace to make this time prayer fruitful. My mother, Immaculate, and Joseph, my guardian Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. It's always a great pleasure for me to be invited by the Day with Mary team to be part of any Day with Mary. I do commend them for this marvellous apostle to do every week. And I commend you for coming this afternoon. Your prayers are so important for the church and for the world. So please do, do not underestimate the powers of your prayers today. I do commend you for coming to this marvellous day at Beckenham. And I have a number of favourite saints. And if I were to name three, they'd be Mother Teresa, Padre Pio and Don Bosco. And all of them did amazing things. We know, of course, that Mother Teresa formed all those marvellous convents throughout the world to not only bring young women to dedicate themselves to God in a consecrated life, but also to look after the poorest of the poor, which they do throughout the world. Most incredible apostolate, most incredible success, one can say. Padre Pio similarly, as we know, had the most amazing gifts of the stigmata, as well as by location, as well as the gift of reading souls. But also, even a secular person would be impressed when a Capuchin friar says in 1940, during the First World War, that he wants to build a church, build a hospital, which indeed, of course, he does and builds it finished in 1956. And Don Bosco, who did amazing work for youth, again, incredibly successful, and indeed, as we know, Saint Dominic Savio, saint even before uh, Saint, Dom Saint Don Bosco passed away himself. And maybe because they're so, so successful, we can't relate to them directly, because you and I are not going to open up hospitals or indeed schools. We're not going to do these amazing things which will leave a legacy with our name printed, as it were, on a foundation stone or indeed in a, in a hospital or school. And yet, somebody else also did not form hospitals. Somebody else did not set up schools. Somebody else doesn't, did not leave, as it were, something like that behind for people to be impressed by the work that they did. And that person is, of course, Our Lady herself. You know, she's the Mother of God, we understand that. But in her time on earth, we do not see her finding any of these things which these great saints that I've mentioned actually did. And yet they and we turn to her. And maybe it's precisely because that she did the ordinary things so well, that she is attractive to all of us, that we can indeed relate to her. We relate to her, obviously, because she is the mother of God, she is a powerful intercessor, but also we think about the things that she did in her human life. And actually, we're very blessed, aren't we, with Google search. We can search these things very quickly. And it's very interesting to see what a woman could actually do in those times. A little bit less, I would suggest, than they can do now. Jewish women in those times took no place in public life and indeed were largely confined to the domestic scene. A woman was exempt from attending the religious services and ceremonies. They didn't have to study the law or the Torah, make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, or indeed they were not allowed to read the law in a synagogue. Schools were just for boys. Okay, and men and women sat apart in the synagogue. And men, of course, did not speak to women in the streets. In the temple, the women had access only to the courts of the Gentiles. And the women during that period of the month, which you all know about, okay, they weren't even allowed there either. Actually, I was reading that today and I was just praying before a blessed sacrament. And I always thought that the Jesus whipping of the temple you know, when he whipped the money changes out of the temples, 
that part of the temple which were just for the Gentiles, i.e. those non-Jews who wanted to pray with the Jews. Obviously, they weren't allowed in the center of the temple, but they were allowed in this bit where Jesus whipped out the money changers. Well, maybe also that was a place where the women prayed as well. So maybe we can think that why Jesus was so upset by the money changers was that was where his mother should be praying, not with people exchanging money and so on. But it was within the household that women had, as it were, they were kings of the castle and had great honor and of course many duties. They would have been responsible for grinding corn, baking and cooking. They would have done the washing, spinning and the weaving. Of course, Mary would have looked after Jesus just like any woman would have looked after their, their children. They would have also waited on their husbands and indeed guests and expected also to obey their husbands. You can imagine relatives of Joseph and Mary coming to Mary's house, Mary's place, to make sure they were welcome and indeed fed. We can think maybe even of clients of Joseph. Joseph, as we know, being a carpenter, doing his carpentering. I don't think that's the right word, is it? Anyway, doing his carpenter work and inviting clients to the house. There would be Our Lady looking after them and so on. And often we can imagine even Mary being involved in the selling of whatever things Joseph was called to make and indeed to help those maybe of the poorer classes who maybe needed some help in one way or another. But all those things that I've mentioned that Mary would have done aren't amazing you know, in themselves. You know, women would have done those things. She did not, as I say, can, we can't compare Mary in that sense to the other saints I've mentioned who did the most extraordinary things. And that is actually my point today. I realize that I'm slightly sort of at the wrong time because I think most of us know that Ash Wednesday is very soon. It's not this Wednesday, but the week after. But my theme of this talk is ordinary time. That we have this green curtain behind us I presume that that will change in, in Lent to a different colour, to purple. And it's a reminder to us that in ordinary time, you know, that word ordinary is really, one would have to say, very unfortunate. Because there's no such thing as ordinary time. The word ordinary really comes just from the fact that time is ordered. And it's related to order, not thing as it were, ordinary and extraordinary. And so what we're called to think about is in this marvelous green color is the fruitfulness of ordinary time. Can you? I was in Egypt a few weeks ago looking across the in the plane as I flying over you can see the desert you know we can have romantic views of the de desert but it's really barren it's really quite forbidding the mountains you know I would suggest they're they're not pretty you know not things I look at, they're quite rugged and they're sort of prettier in their own way. But I wouldn't have a picture of a rugged mountain on my wall. But I was in Donegal in September and that was just delightful. And you had green all over the place, you know, green grass, trees and so on. Went up also uh, the week as well, Craig Patrick uh, in Mayo and so on. Most marvelous scene of fruitfulness, of the fruitfulness of nature. When the priest wears green in ordinary time as he does this weekend, and indeed next weekend as well, that green gives us the clue as regards the, really the extraordinary nature of ordinary time. It's not called me ordinary in that sense that we sometimes think of ordinary. It's called to be a great fruitful time where maybe the ordinary things that we do they're not ordinary. They're called to be, as we know, done with great love of God and with great care and attention to him. And in that way, we can relate to Our Lady. The things she did when she was at home in Nazareth and so on, all those things she did, we can't say that they were extraordinary in the sense of 
like Mother Teresa or Padre Pio or indeed Don Bosco, she has left no legacy of schools or hospitals. And yet, precisely that is the case, that precisely because of her ordinary things became so supernatural, then indeed the three people I've mentioned turn to her and say the most amazing things about her and say actually we need Mary's help to do the things that we do, you know, and actually say to us, you know, have a tender and deep devotion to her. Blessed Mother Teresa said, if ever you feel distressed during your day, call upon Our Lady. Just say this simple prayer, Mary, Mother of Jesus, be to me a mother now. She says, I must admit this prayer has never failed me. You know, Patrick Pio says, may the mother of Jesus and our mother always smile on your spirit, obtaining from it, for it from her most holy son, every heavenly blessing. Goes on to say, always stay close to the heavenly mother because she is the sea to be crossed to reach the shores of eternal splendor. And also, Padre Pia goes on, let us bind ourselves tightly to the soulful heart of our Heavenly Mother, reflect in its boundless grief, and how precious is our soul. Both marvellous witnesses of saying, turn to Our Lady, you know, turn to her. We ask her to help in the day-to-day -day things of our lives, because we can relate to her in that. She did the day-to-day -day things she was called to do, but she would have done them with a profound love of God and a profound courtesy and tenderness and care. Don Bosco, you know, okay, I could have quoted, got so many quotes from all these saints, but Saint Bosco said the most marvelous things about Our Lady. It says, Mary most holy has always made herself a mother for us. And, you know, Mary wants the real thing, not appearances. One who trusts in Mary will never be disappointed. And just a final quote from Don Bosco. Mary assures us if we are devoted to her, she will count us among her children cover us with her mantle and shower us with blessings in this world so as to gain heaven uh, for us. And I think what's instructive to me would be Padre Pio in his earlier life, I think this is actually before he had the stigmata, he formed spiritual sons and daughters and there are five rules for this uh, spiritual growth. Weekly confession, daily communion, spiritual reading, meditation, and examination of conscience. And explaining these spiritual rules, pa uh, Padre Pio put it thus, he said he compared it to dusting a room, you know, and that's what he compared confession to. He said, and he said the two times of meditation, he stated two times of meditation, should in the morning to prepare for battle, and in the evening to purify the soul. But if, each, if we have a look at each of those five, we see that Our Lady would have been a spiritual, as it were, son and daughter of Padre Pio, par excellence with regards to weekly confession. Of course, she didn't need to go to confession, she was without sin. With regards to daily communion, she was in the presence of Jesus day and night for 30 years before the public life. Spiritual reading, she, as we know, pondered things in her heart, just on a number of occasions in the Bible, and of course, many other occasions beside. Meditation, she would have been a soul, an exemplar of the meditative life, thinking about things deeply and the plan of Jesus for the world, indeed, what God wanted her to do, as well as not just be the mother of Jesus, but indeed the mother of our soul. And so we have the clue, I think, to Our Lady's most marvellous way that we can relate to her. That we admire these great saints, okay, but we can't emulate them. 
You know, I have no doubts I will not be finding any hospitals or schools. I'll be humbly, hopefully humbly anyway, in my parish, plugging away St. Anselm's Dartford, certainly for the next few years and so on. I can't really turn around, I can't even wake up tomorrow and think, I should be doing more. I should be sort of opening up a school. I should be, you know, forming a hospital somewhere. And I'm sure none of you think of that. None of you get up to work, be getting up tomorrow morning and thinking, Mother Teresa has inspired me. I'm going to now, I'm going to, going to start a hospital somewhere. It's not our vocations to do that. Our vocation is to do great things for God, but maybe it is in the ordinary things. And that's how we can indeed relate to Mary and see actually that these great saints, they turn to her. They ask for her intercession. You know, she who did these ordinary things so well, she's the one that they turn to. You know, we think of other great saints, you know, St. Therese of Lisieux and Avila and so on, who also did great things for God and formed convents and so on. But it's Our Lady who is the wonderful exemplar of maybe our lives. You know, ordinary things we do at home, our work, our school, the colleagues that we meet in our social lives as well as in our work and so on. How we, how we called to inspire them so that indeed they come close to Christ through the powerful intercession of Our Lady. So as we know, Ash Wednesday is soon upon us in a week and a half. But it's my job to say, look, let's knock ordinary, let's not knock ordinary time. That phrase is really unfortunate. But actually, you know, if we were to really consider the next week and a half and really consider a lady's example of her life, then actually we can actually really relate to her. Because as I've indicated, the woman's life in those days, she would have been able to, even if she wanted to start up a school or to form a hospital and so on, like Padre Pio or Mother Teresa, she wouldn't have been able to do that. What she could do for God, she did, and she did it in the most wonderful way. We're called maybe each day to listen to Padre Pio's example of starting the day, like starting a battle saying, I wish to start well, start to do the will of God, think of what God really wants me to do today. And at the end of the day, consider how we've done, purify the soul and ask, of, ask God to forgive us the times we've not been so generous in our thoughts and our time with him. But to, for me to make you aware of the value of today, your prayers are just so important for this church, for the church in Southwark and the church throughout the world. And the while we consider these things, maybe ordinary things, we know that St. Mother Teresa, Padre Pio, and indeed Don Bosco would have depended on the prayers of so many others who would have done these ordinary things, just like Our Lady, prayers and work and so on, but would have done, done them with the deepest love of God. And of course, we do them with the deepest love of Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.